Welcome to a conversation with Martin Nissenholz, founder of two highly successful digital media divisions inside large companies, Ogilvy Interactive and New York Times Digital, and currently professor of the practice of digital communication at Boston University. I'm Ken Freeman, Allen Question Professor and Dean at the Boston University Question School of Business. Martin, good afternoon. How did you become interested in digital technology? You're a digital pioneer among, in our midst. Well, it was so early. It was the late 70s, and it happened uh, almost by accident. Um, I, had, uh, I, had, I, I had gotten my master's degree, and I was actually working on a PhD at the time. And I was offered a job for one year to work on a National Science Foundation funded project in New York. And I had been in Philadelphia for my whole life, and I decided to go for it. And I went up to Greenwich Village and you know, joined NYU for that project. I expected to go back after the year, but then once I got there, I, uh, I decided that that was where I wanted to spend my, my career. So, so you didn't get your PhD I never did end. get my PhD, no. And it began yeah. an amazing journey for you. It did, it did, an amazing journey, so yeah. yeah. So, now have you always thought of yourself as an entrepreneur in this context? I, I, I've always had an entrepreneurial bent. Um, I started a bunch of businesses when I was a, a little kid. Um, and obviously none of them turned into Microsoft, but you know, they were, they were fun little businesses. Yeah, yeah, no, I always thought of myself that way. And you went to Ogilvy. Uh, went to Ogilvy, No yeah. online presence when you arrived, or very limited, I imagine. No, no online presence at all. Uh, but what happened to, to, to catalyze the Ogilvy thing is that Time Inc., the, 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 you know, the old newspaper company that we now think of as a, a, kind of as an old media company, back then it was a titan of media, was doing an experiment with teletext. This is the technology that I was working with at NYU. And, and they needed somebody to, to help them at Ogilvy figure out how to advertise on this. So Ogilvy and Time Inc. got together and they brought me in. And so uh, I started the interactive marketing group, which turned into Ogilvy Interactive in, in I think it was March of 83. And when you began creating the interactive marketing group, were you operating as a very separate group of individuals in the Ogilvy family, or were you part and parcel of the overall organization? That's a great question. Initially, uh, I was actually attached to the creative department, just trying to figure out the product, in a sense. Um, then uh, we, we decided that, you know, actually it, it could be turned into a business, and we created a separate unit, but it was a part of uh, Ogilvy's New York agency. It wasn't. It wasn't like a separate, completely separate company or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was a separate unit inside of the the mothership. Did you have a clear plan of what this would become while you were well, Ogilvy, or was this something that you would be finding yourself looking around corners, if you will, trying to anticipate where the yeah? Was I mean, going? it was a research and development unit in a way. All the big media companies were experimenting with interactivity back then. Um, this is this is before that first version of interactivity failed. The PC had just been invented, believe it or not. So the IBM PC, Apple had brought its PC to the market, and then IBM came, you know, in, in, in a little bit later, I think in '81. And so everything was just beginning to develop. There were there was no infrastructure. So by definition, you know, we were experimenting, and and fortunately, Ogilvy had some wonderful clients who really wanted to try to understand the future. And they you know, paid us, and so we uh, worked with them for, for 10 years. I mean, it was, it was a tough go, I have to say. It, it's a, there's a, a lot of lessons about constancy of purpose and, and other, other things in there. I mean, it, it, was, it was not easy. Not that, easy those, at those all. Those were very hard years, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And now, after your time at Ogilvy, you said, I want to do this again, essentially, from the outside looking in. You went over to the New York Times. Well, I was at Ameritech for a year. For a year. Yeah, for a year. And I was so happy to come back to New York and work for the Times. Yeah, it was, I, I, I had always read the New York Times growing up in, in, in college. And so it was something I had great respect for, and I just, I thought I was in Nirvana when I got that job. So you took a detour to Ameritech, and exactly. they were exploring as well, no They doubt. were, they were. They, you know, this was the era of deregulation in the mid-90s, and so they were doing what is called a cable overbuild. They were actually doing a duplicate cable service in Chicago, and they needed programming for that service, both linear and interactive, and they hired me to run that. Uh -huh. So that was a, a, a fun time, but um, I was really happy to to join the to, family to join in the New York the, Times. To join the New York Times, yeah, yeah. So when you went to the New York Times, 
Uh, I love the title that you started out with. You were the, uh, the head of the electronic media company in right. 1995. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right. As we look back on that, it, it, it's, it's fun to think about. When you went into the job, was there, was there clarity of purpose when you arrived, or were you given a, a, a blank sheet of paper, or how did how Again, did I mean, you, you look back 20-some years and you feel, oh, well, this is natural, right? At the time, no one knew uh, that this was actually going to work. In fact, I remember being on the, the beach with my brother-in-law, and he said, you know, what are you going to do when this thing fails? And I never really thought about it very hard. You know, I thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll make it work, right? <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I mean, I, 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 I was always the, the kind of person who, you know, w was optimistic about, you have to be optimistic if you're going to do this kind of work. Uh. It, it's just not possible to, to get up every day otherwise. <laughs> yeah. There's too many ways you might fail, so you really have to have that positive attitude. Well, yeah, I mean, look, by the time, I mean, you know, five or six years, seven years in, by the time it was clear that the internet was going to change the world, it started to get a lot easier, right? But, but, but when, when nobody knows what's going to happen and you're out there alone, that's a different feeling. And that's what I meant when, about the Ogilvy years, yes. because there, there were a lot of years there where people were, you know, not, not happy to, to see this division still around, mm. to be perfectly sure. honest. So are the resistors, the change yeah. resistors yeah. are saying, why oh, yeah. in the world, you're Believe changing me. my world. Most, most are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now at the Times, this was 95 yeah. when you began, the, the dot-com bubble didn't burst until 00 and 00, 2000, yeah. 2001. Yeah, yeah. Were there key decisions you made early on that were definitive for the future strategy for New York Times? Oh, absolutely. I think the, the first and most important decision that we made was to require registration to use the website. Um, Wired Magazine had tried this, it had failed. A lot of people thought that it wouldn't work at the New York Times, but, but there, ha having, having come from Ogilvy, which is obviously a, a, a marketing firm, yes. I just had the sense that we really needed to, to get as much data as possible on, on our users. So at the time, you know, there, there, there was no ad tech, so essentially the way we got the data was simply by asking the users. And that was called permission marketing. It was, you give me your, your data, I'll give you a free website. Uh -huh. It was a much more explicit relationship than you have today, where most people don't even know they're being tracked half the time. Yes. And that's part of the privacy problem, the, the whole idea of surveillance capitalism, which is... An ethical is, issue for the industry in a way. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, oh, yeah. for sure, yeah. So, yeah. so you started out with free registration. We did. But fairly soon thereafter decided maybe that it would be good to get some revenue associated with this. And well, the registration subscribers uh, pay for the privilege. No, this is a very interesting and controversial part of the history. Um, the Wall Street Journal had come out right before we did with a pay model. Now the journal is a, at that time in particular was a B2B product. A lot of the, the subscribers were being subsidized by their businesses. We felt as a general interest newspaper, as a consumer product, we needed to build a big audience in order to build an advertising business, which was where the scalable mm -hmm. business was. We didn't want to create a newsletter. Mm -hmm. So we felt that the free model would give us that runway. We did charge overseas just because we had to, there was a, there was sort of a cultural element to this. It was, it was not a popular decision at the time not to, uh, to charge. Um, in retrospect, I think it was exactly the right decision. But um, later, when the audience was large enough, we then switched then on moved. and we moved and, and it was, thankfully it was successful. But yeah. the, at the time, I, I just wanted to build a scalable audience. Building audience. Yeah, yeah. building audience. And right. the, when the, the price business. is right, it helps. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and yeah. with, with well, a great product, also, of course. It, there was a lot of competition from CNN and others that would never charge, right? CNN is a, has a mm -hmm. cable model, mm -hmm. uh, the broadcast networks. Everything collided instantly when the World Wide Web was created. We weren't in the newspaper business anymore. We were competing generally in the you know mm -hmm. electronic news yeah. business. So other key decisions. So the key decision initially to be free, to build base, the decision later on to, to begin charging for the service at the right moment as the base had been built. Right. Are there other key decisions that, that came along that were vital to the success of New York Times? I think Digital? one key decision was how you staff a, a, a small unit like that. I decided to staff it with a combination of people from inside the company and from outside. And, and look, you could go with all insiders, you could go, go with all outsiders. I felt that if we could manage to get the mix right, it would be best. Um, it's hard because the outsiders have 
a perspective that the insiders might not like and the insiders might be a little bit resistant to change. But I think if you can build a team like that, um, you're better off than just going with all insiders or all outsiders. So, so diversity helped, essentially. Yeah. At Ogilvy, it was all outsiders because no one at that time wanted to work on it from the inside. And on the, <laughs> on the, at the Times, you started as a separate entity within the Times as well. You as said, opposed started to the, as a unit of the Times. Unit. Right? It was not a separate entity in the sense that it was an IPO-able entity. That mm -hmm. didn't come until the so dot-com boom. Yeah. And, and then when did the integration take place of the digital and the traditional Times together? Well, it started as a, as a, oh, okay, so it started as a separate unit. Mm -hmm. Then we completely broke out, mm -hmm. and we were, you know, headed toward public. an IPO. Yeah. The dot-com bust got in the way of that. We remained completely separate for about four more years, and mm -hmm. then in 2005, with the, uh, with the with a new CEO in the business, there was a decision to integrate the uh, the so operations. So it was primarily a strategic decision as much as anything uh, in terms of senior leadership saying it's time to bring the two, enter y to yeah. two pieces together. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, that must have been quite challenging, I imagine, to, to integrate it what had become two very challenging. different cultures. It was incredibly challenging. It had become two very different mm -hmm, cultures. Mm -hmm. And the, in my view, the business side part of the digital culture felt like they were being taken over. The news side really wanted to work for the New York Times newsroom. It was an interesting, uh, you know, dichotomy. The, mm -hmm. the news side people seemed to very happy to come over and be in the, in, with the mothership. The business side people were were less less happy with that. It's an interesting. It's That's just an interesting, interesting dynamic, yeah, isn't it? Very interesting dynamic. So the journalists more readily adopted yeah. themselves to being uh, in multiple. Well, they forms always of wanted the product. Imprimatur of the uh, of the New York Times. You know, as journalists. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I don't blame them. <laughs> so the imprimatur historically, when I was a kid, was uh, the New York Times would say all the news that's fit to print. Correct. Uh, is there a new imprimatur at the New York Times? Well, there, there. We actually held a contest right after I joined in the mid '90s to figure out what we were going to put on the website, and all the news that's, that's fit to print won. Now, don't ask me why it won, <laughs> but I think it's a sign. It was a sign of things to come. <laughs> yes, that way. How about that? Now, the <laughs> digital age, uh, we're all in the midst of it, and, and certainly the, the news industry has been in the forefront uh, with others in terms of being uh, in, the, in the leading edge of change. Uh, in industry, typically, we'll, we'll establish metrics to measure progress in what we do. And, and I'm just wondering, as you think about the, the measurements of success in the dig digital age, uh, what are some of the digital measures that you've used as you've led uh, two enterprises completely through their transformation, and, and how do you think these measures will evolve in the future? Well, to be fair, Ogilvy was done before the web was meaningful. It was done in a world of, of proprietary online services. Remember America Online? Yes. That was a uh, <laughs> proprietary online service, Prodigy, CompuServe, those, mm -hmm. those services, as, as well as standalone machines. Um, so that was a different world. Once the web came along, standards evolved pretty quickly. And you know, for a long time, the standards were, you know, and, and believe it or not, still are monthly unique visitors. Is that right? Which is, which is uh, to me, a, 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 um, not not a great metric. Yeah, it's not yeah. a great metric. It doesn't say anything about how engaged these visitors are or or anything. Mm -hmm. So you'll see, well, BuzzFeed has 350 million unique visitors. Okay, so what? You know, it, at some in some it? abstract yeah. way, yeah, it's a it's a, an indication of how much audience they have. Yeah. yeah, But not really how much of a of an economic engine they are because you need to have. Um, you need to be creating a lot of inventory behind those visitors in order for that to work. And so, there needs to be revenue. There needs to be there revenue. There needs to be revenue, right. So the dot-com bubble burst in large part because revenues weren't following those, eyeball, those eyeballs, if you That's will. That's correct, yeah. Uh, and, and are we, people now say that today's world, it's, it's a different world. We've learned that lesson, that revenues matter. Uh, do you think that the full lesson's been fully learned by the, the digital? Uh, I think there's always there? a tendency for, um, uh, the word bubble might be an overstatement about what has taken place over the last four or five years, but um, I think you, you know you saw valuations decline pretty considerably mm -hmm. over the last 12 months. Um, the so-called unicorns, yes. uh, in, in, mostly in Silicon Valley, um, and there I do think, yeah, I do think that valuations got ahead of uh, of of uh, business fundamentals to some extent. 
We're seeing not, not to the extent of the dot com. Not like though. the dot com. That, that was insane. That was unique. <laughs> that was that was a unique period in, in American capitalism. And to yes. think you were right on the heels of an IPO <laughs> and, and called it off it. literally with so many it. others, I guess, uh, at that moment. Yeah. <laughs> in recent years, Timing there's been changes yeah. in the newspaper industry. We can't help but think, for instance, of Jeff Bezos uh, buying the Washington Post, uh, paying $250 million for the opportunity, pumping millions of dollars into the company, hiring staff, investing in digital operations, offering free subscriptions to Amazon Prime members. Uh, what's your sense of, of why he might have done it, and, and does he have a formula that maybe can win in this, in this environment? Well, I, I have no insight into why he did it other than what I've read, which is that you know, he, he and Don Graham, who was the former owner, had a conversation at an Allen & Company conference, and he decided it was something he wanted to do. Um, uh, the cynics you know, have, have suggested that he wants uh, leverage in Washington. I don't think that's the reason he did it. I think he did it because I think he thinks of it as an interesting business challenge and, and as, a, as an important uh, uh, part of our democracy. I, I give him that, mm. that benefit of the you doubt. Do. Absolutely, yeah. We've also more recently had Apple, Facebook, and even now Google developing their own news sites for more readable uh, content on mobile devices, um, and essentially creating third-party platforms right. that newspapers have to rely on yeah. in some respects yeah. to get the news out. Yeah. What's your sense of, is this a disruptive move by these enterprises, or is it just a, a, a natural evolution of the maturing and the convergence? I of don't think anyone knows. Um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is, is on the uh, uh, cover of The Economist this week dressed as a Roman emperor or, or, or you know, <laughs> a, a cr created as a Roman. And I think, you know, there's a lot of concern that um, uh, if Facebook and Google become the principal distribution channels for content, that, uh, you know, there's, there's something very significant at risk. And I agree with that. Um, I think they can be useful tactics. But I don't think that it's it's a good idea to uh, for a news company to, to to depend on them as as distributors like CNN depends upon Comcast. Independence for independence of thought, independence of opinion. Yeah, I mean right. their algorithms are, are are black boxes. You you don't really know what they reward, and they can change as they often do. Uh, the algorithms that actually show the content in the news feeds, um, whether it's Facebook's news feeder. It feels almost like each of us as individuals now with our mobile devices are, are, are controlling what news we will receive and what news we won't. Uh, and also that we've all in some ways become news reporters on our own uh, with uh, posting photographs, being on the yeah. scene. Yeah, uh, yeah. As we think about the traditional newspaper industry, both at the digital and the print side, uh, is this something also that, that, is there a way the newspaper industry can make this a source of advantage as opposed to potentially a disadvantage? I, I don't know. Um, certainly the biggest brands seem to be doing okay, whether it's the New York Times or, or the Financial Times, which just got sold to Nikkei for over a billion dollars. I mean, that was, a, I think, a, 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 a sign that they have sort of turned the corner there. But, but um, where I see the challenge is in metropolitan newspapers like the Boston Globe, like the Washington Post. Now, the Washington Post obviously is, mm -hmm. is in a different situation with Bezos in, in charge of it. And maybe the, the Boston Globe is with John Henry. It's a similar model, um, but um, very, very tough go. Uh, very tough very go tough. at this point. Yeah. So there will be people exiting the business, is what you see. I imagine. I think. So, yeah. I or think there. I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation. I think there's going to be a lot of cost cutting, um, even more than there has been. Um, and the important thing is to find a model where uh, these companies can survive, yeah. um, because right now I don't think we have one. <laughs> Yeah. And you mentioned BuzzFeed earlier. It seems like they're taking a model of, of the, getting the, the users, if you will, the, but at the very same time, they're investing heavily in investigative reporting, I believe, at the same time. Yeah. I mean, they've invested some. Um, Jill is, it, it, it'll be interesting to call, talk to Jill Abramson about BuzzFeed, but um, uh, there's a big difference between BuzzFeed and reporting on your local city council and reporting mm -hmm. on the companies that exist in a particular city, large or small. It's a, it's, I, I, I think there's plenty of room for large multinational brands like BuzzFeed to create business mm -hmm. models on the web, but is BuzzFeed gonna come in and cover 
the, um, the city council here in Boston, the school boards, the maybe. I mean, anything is possible. Yeah. Uh, anything is possible. But right now, that's not happening. Yeah. The, you mentioned financial model, uh, questionable, difficult. Do you see a solution uh, for the traditional newspaper industry, those that have entered the digital world in addition to print, to be able to compensate for the loss of print revenues as, as they're striving to build online revenues moving Well, forward? there are a bunch of things happening. Um, Hearst, for example, has pioneered local marketing services, so going out and offering essentially advertising agency services to local businesses to subsidize the journalism. So there are all sorts of experiments like that taking place. I don't think anyone has the definitive model yet, but I think what will happen is uh, people will experiment. Um, about three years ago, the uh, FCC wrote a report, and they even then identified local journalism as the most vulnerable. Mm. And the conclusion of the report was, you know, it's going to take a lot of experimentation and entrepreneurial activity before a formula is found. And I don't think one has been found yet. Uh, advertising has often been used as part of being the savior for, for, uh, yeah, for digital because... startups. Do you see it playing a prominent role in, in helping the news industry uh, survive and thrive in the future? It's, it's, it will play a role. I don't know about a prominent role. It's become unbundled from the you know, mm -hmm. the, former, the former thing that was a newspaper bundle. Remember classified advertising? Sure yeah. Well, that essentially was the, the powerhouse of the newspaper industry, and that's all gone as, you know, as they've created, as, as digital companies have created their own classified services. And it's possible now to not access to the advertising, to block it as a consumer in many cases. Ad blocking is becoming more and more important. Um, and I think that's a part of the problem. The, the, the advertising has become intrusive. It's become, all advertising is intrusive by definition, but it's become annoying. Yes, yes. And I think that the consumer has basically said enough. Yeah. And so they, they are installing ad blockers now. And, and that's, you're, you're, you're hitting on all of the, uh, the issues that the industry faces, yeah. I mean, I, I find it um, um, disappointing that um, we haven't seen pretty much anywhere um, a strong willingness to pay on the part of consumers for local journalism. You know, it used to be that 60, 70 percent of a, of, a, of a city's population read a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And you go out and you start charging for these products and you get very few people very willing to pay. So national, international, you see a brighter well, future. because of the scale, yeah. right? You yeah. know, the Times now has over a million subscribers but it has a, an addressable market of the globe. Mm -hmm. So if you do that math and you bring it down to a local city, actually, it's very, you know, the, the Times has done well globally, but if it was in its own little local market, it would just be a few thousand people. Wow. Yeah. Uh, native advertising is raised now, too, the idea of further melding. Yeah, and that's BuzzFeed. What's covered as well, yeah. even, in the, but in, even in the traditional outlets, if you'll. Do you, do you, I would think that that could risk... Uh, the, the compromising the integrity historically of, of, of the great names in, yeah. in, in newspapers. I think that most newspapers have really managed that, managed it pretty well. Um, it, it's, it's not so much that um, there's a problem with, with native, you know, from an ethical perspective, I don't think, although obviously you have to have certain, uh, you know, you have to have behaviors there that make sense. It's not that. Uh, it, it, it's that. It's that. It's that. Native advertising is hard to scale because every time you create a native campaign, right? You see, if you're creating it for this one, and then you're creating it for that one, and then you create. It's, it's a hard, very it, hard. There's a wonderful thing about TV stamp. You know, 30 second and 60 second standards, right? You stamp <laughs> them out. They play everywhere. It's, it's, it's a done. beautiful thing, right? It's done, right? <laughs> beautiful thing, really, truly. <laughs> now you have a, a tradition of looking around corners uh, as you've done your thing in your wonderful career all the way through, Martin. Uh, there are lots of topics now, virtual reality, artificial intelligence. Do you see, what's you, what do you see around the corner that's next as the, as the newspaper industry, the news industry uh, addresses the future? Well, I mean, I, I've, I've actually, honestly, never been one to be, I, I'm not a futurist. I, I, I mean, my career has been spent managing businesses and grinding it out, <laughs> honestly. Um, and so I, 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 I actually have a hard time with the futurist thing and saying, well, in five years we're going to reach the singularity and everybody's going to, I, I, just, I just don't know how to do that. So 
I, you know, I would say that you know, putting, putting one foot in front of the other is probably the best course of action. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, if you'd like a couple of, of comments about that, I, I, I do think virtual reality is a very interesting technology, particularly in gaming. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's going to be a, a fascinating new creative platform for the gamers, and, and it, it, it'll be uh, exciting. Yeah. Um, I'm not so sure about news. It, it doesn't feel quite right to me for, for news. But Beyond the crossword puzzle. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, but, but, you know, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the, the argument would be, well, you can actually cr take somebody and Im immerse them into the, the neighborhood that you're writing about. If, if you were writing about Brussels, for example, you'd actually put the person in uh, Mullenbeck and have them. And that's cool, yeah. I mean, if you can do that, I don't know. Uh, whether it's it's practical or not, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, Martin, is there is there something that's been the key to your success uh, through your career? Uh, you know, I th I think resiliency would the, be the the word that I would use. I mean, it's it's really easy from this perspective to say, well, all that stuff was it just happened, and it. But at the time when you're looking forward, a lot of times it you know you 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 just face challenges and. Um, You've got to be resilient if you're going to do stuff like this. Entrepreneurs in particular. I, I, I'm not an entrepreneur, as you suggested. I created two divisions within big companies, which is a form of, we call it intrapreneurialism, right? And it, it's it, actually, I like to say it, it comes with all the, all the uh, risk of an entrepreneurial activity and none of the upside. <laughs> so I, I think probably that would suggest that I'm actually pretty stupid at the end of the day. But because uh, if I had created a big agency or a big publication, you know, and I own you know half or more of it, that would have been a much, uh, much more lucrative way to go. But but no, all, all kidding aside, you, you obviously couldn't do that uh, at the New York Times. So Martin, as as you think about the next generation, the students that are going to oh, be yeah, they so, leave so academia, exciting, yeah. so. So advice for, for students that will be leaving the safety of academia and, and going out there and, and, and encountering the world, a digital world, if you will, what advice would you have for, for uh, students today? Well, I mean, I think the, the best advice I, I can give is to um, remain open to w w the, the just wonderful experiences. You know, it, everything is not going to be perfect all the time. And you, you, you go in and you, you, you make, oftentimes you just have to make, as they say, you, ha, you just have to make lemonade out of lemons and just keep <laughs> making that lemonade. And it'll, it, as, if you continue to do that, it'll actually work for you. It, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll turn it into something great. Never yeah. give up. Yeah, Never resilience, up. as you yeah. mentioned earlier, yeah. and be open to the opportunities. Be open in there. and flexible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, if you're a, if you're a great quarterback, you know, and and you can you replace Tom Brady. Go for that, man. But if if you don't have that kind of skill, I say be open. Be a little more open. Yeah, oh, be a little more great. open. Well, fantastic. <laughs> We've been in conversation with Martin Nisenholtz, founder of two highly successful digital media divisions inside large companies, Ogilvy Interva Interactive and New York Times Digital, and currently professor of the practice of digital communication at Boston University. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Martin. Thank you.